My name is David Sobzak. I'm the treasurer of SAVE, and I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Hodge tonight. Uh, thank you all for attending. I see from the list of participants here that we have uh, some people that have attended almost every lecture we've uh, sponsored this season, and I see some new names as well, so welcome to all. Adam Hodge is a uh, citizen of uh, the city of Toledo. He is also the associate professor and chair of the Department of History at Lord University since 2013. Prior to 2013, he was a lecturer at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. He was awarded several times for his expertise and love for his subject areas. He published one book and two others are forthcoming on the Arctic grayling in Michigan and Montana and in the bull trout in Montana. He has written numerous articles in journals on Native Americans, conservation, and the environment, specifically on fish and fishing. His professional memberships include the American Historical Association, the American Society for Environmental History. His works are a result of his love for fly fishing in Michigan and Montana. And wouldn't we all like to enjoy fly fishing in both of those areas, except Michigan, maybe not so right now with the problems they're having with COVID. I'd like to introduce Dr. Hodge. Uh, good evening. Everybody hear me all right? Yes. Uh-huh. All right. Should be able to see my PowerPoint presentation now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so just let me know any tech issues come up or whatever uh, from the viewer end, but otherwise uh, I want to start by uh, thanking uh, SAVE, uh, specifically uh, Sister Rosine and also uh, John for uh, inviting me, for setting this up, for all the membership of uh, SAVE that was involved in uh, rubber stamping. Uh, me coming and talking to this uh, group. So uh, I appreciate that. And of course, to uh, everybody else, it looked like it was 20 some folks, 27 total, uh, who took some time uh, out of their evening to attend this. So I, I, I appreciate that. So uh, I thought David did a pretty good job introducing myself. So I won't bother uh, going into anything more about that. I uh, just jump transition nicely into my research. Uh, my first book focused on uh, Native American history, uh, focusing on Wyoming, the Eastern Shoshone tribe. It was focused on an environmental history. And as I wrapped up uh, work on that book, I, a couple of years ago, I was thinking about what I wanted to research next. And one thing led to another, and I ended up trying to uh, bring it together uh, a couple of my passions, of course, history, but also uh, fly fishing. So I wanted to bring those together in some sort of meaningful way. And I, you know, just through the course of reading and also my own personal experiences, uh, my wife scoffs, but I call it field work uh, when I'm out fishing, uh, came across, you know, what I think are a couple of uh, worthwhile topics. And of course, one of the big pieces of advice that I got when I was in graduate school was uh, pick topics, pursue topics that take you places you want to go. So naturally, I've uh, been vacationing in, the, in uh, Montana since the mid-90s. My folks, I think they're, I saw them on the call. They live out there now. Uh, so it's uh, multiple reasons to get out to Montana, uh, professional and uh, personal. So uh, I got a couple of uh, articles. Uh, well, one that recently came out that does put together these projects uh, bull trout and Arctic grayling. I got one uh, forthcoming sometime in the next year or so on Arctic grayling in environmental history, uh, the journal uh, comparing Michigan and Montana. And then of course I have uh, the book projects in the works, one specifically focusing on bull trout in the Bitterroot drainage and a farther, uh, a, a bigger sweeping history of grayling and bull trout in Michigan. I'm sorry, I should say just grayling in Michigan and Montana. So sort of juggling this, but focusing mostly at the moment on the bull trout one. Uh, so the uh, 
I thought this would be a good opportunity to, again, bring those projects together. I do like putting them side by side because there are a lot of parallels between the two, but there are some very important distinctions. And at this point, you may be wondering, uh, what's the deal with the background? It's uh, twofold in purpose. One, uh, doing the Zoom from home, and I don't particularly like the background I got to work with in my workspace, so I'll spare you that. But also, I picked a uh, photograph that I took a couple of summers ago that does have significance within this this presentation. So I will uh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. I don't want to jump the gun on that. And so, um, <clears throat> the, so start with a couple of quick species overviews. I won't necessarily get into the weeds on all of these. Uh, you may have already gathered that uh, I am trained as a historian and I'm moving into you know, some uh, fish history. So this is a lot of learning on the fly, uh, the scientific side of things. And it's fun, been fun to get in the weeds, so to speak, on you know, uh, stream survey reports, uh, studies of interspecies interactions, sediment and species composition, all these sort of fun things that uh, really require me to uh, challenge my training as a humanist uh, and bring together historical documents, which are absolutely vital, uh, but pair those with uh, pair those with the findings of scientific studies to uh, really, I think uh, the whole goal of my research projects is to offer a deeper historical understanding of how we got to where we're at today with these two very imperiled uh, fish species. Uh, so the Arctic grayling, you have the historic range here, which is fairly generous, especially on the U.S. side of things. Uh, some of those do denote introduced populations. Uh, this was the best map I could find on the fly. But uh, historically, uh, grayling's presence in uh, both Michigan and Montana, pretty spotty, uh, found uh, within some river systems, but not others. Michigan, mainly in the upper lower peninsula, a tiny portion of the upper and uh, Montana, mainly uh, upper Missouri drainage above the three forks. And even then it was pretty spotty uh, distribution just to give you a feel for that. When Lewis and Clark did their journey westward, they caught Arctic grayling in exactly one location uh, along the Beaverhead River in Montana. Nowhere else did they pull them uh, out of the water. And in a twist of irony, of course, uh, that stretch of the Beaverhead is now uh, part of Clark Canyon Reservoir. It's impounded by a dam. So uh, the appearance of the grayling gave you some sense here. They're not especially big fish, maybe a foot and a half long, something like that. They will get bigger in some areas up in uh, Alaska, Canada, whatnot. But it, well, my focal point is uh, lower 48 and a uh, foot and a half, maybe a pound or two. They're not exceptionally big fish, but they are beautiful fish, especially that uh, dorsal fin there. Uh, very uh, vibrant coloration, habitat, cold water streams. They are, uh, you know, in a salmon family, uh, you know, with trout, char, salmon, so on and so forth, whitefish. Uh, so they do require cooler water, clean water. Uh, in Michigan and Montana, historically, most of the populations were fluvial, which means stream or river dwelling, migrate throughout them. And uh, there were a few uh, ad fluvial or, uh, lacustrine populations, which means lake, lake dwelling, sometimes with a migratory component, uh, but most of them were river dwelling. And the case is the opposite now in Montana, where most grayling populations have been inter are introduced ones uh, that went into high mountain lakes and most of the river variety is gone now. Very small stretch, it's estimated 5% of the historic range in Montana uh, that had grayling, has grayling now as far as the uh, streams go. Uh, life history, I kind of already alluded to that, they're pretty migratory fish. Even today they are known to migrate fairly extensively in their sort of last native stronghold in Montana, 50, 60 miles over the course of a year between various habitats. So you might be already uh, tipped off to one of the causes of the species decline in both Michigan and Montana, and that is going to be dams that sever, way, uh, sever uh, waterway connectivity. Diet, uh, primarily bug eaters, uh, often in the larva stage. 
and the current status, as I mentioned, uh, they are, uh, they're healthy enough well up north, uh, Alaska, Canada, but they are imperiled in Montana. Uh, they have since 1992-ish, might have been 91, uh, was the first petition to have them listed under the Endangered Species Act. And most the most recent action that I'm aware of was a, a couple years ago, a court ordered the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to reconsider its, its recent determination uh, that uh, grayling would not be listed as threatened or endangered. Basically that the state of Montana was doing enough in collaboration with landowners, with uh, you know, various state agencies to protect grayling habitat and the population. So uh, longtime candidate, status still in limbo, in limbo as far as the Endangered Species Act uh, goes. So the uh, bull trout uh, historic range, you can see here, much more uh, limited, uh, basically Pacific Northwest, mostly uh, inland areas, not necessarily coastal, uh, with the exception of Puget Sound. Uh, the range is significantly diminished. This is a, uh, a map depiction of the, the historic range. You can lop off for sure the, the part that extends down into California at the lower left. That population is now extinct. So there has been considerable range contraction with both uh, bull trout and grayling, uh, especially over the last 150 years. The uh, appearance of bull trout, these are, uh, they come in different shapes and sizes sizes especially. Uh, the migratory ones could get three plus feet long. They're big guys. Uh, they weigh, I want to say the the record in the lower 48 is 30 some, 40 some pounds. They get pretty big. Uh, there is a stream resident variety that does not migrate between lakes, uh, rivers, anything like that. They stay in tributary networks. They maybe get a foot long something like that, they don't get particularly big, but the migratory ones, of uh, which there are relatively few left anymore, uh, for reasons that I'll talk about, they get pretty big. They are not especially attractive looking fish. Uh, they can in fact look quite menacing. You got, uh, it was a, either a recently spawning or preparing to spawn male here. You can tell from the kite, the hooked underjaw, uh, menacing looking fish. The bellies, as you can see here, do redden during the spawning uh, time for males in particular, but otherwise they're kind of a plain looking grayish, greenish fish, some white spots on them. Uh, in contrast to the grayling, which I kind of point that out because that'll be relevant to how people have historically viewed these two species. Uh, life history, uh, again, it varies. As I mentioned, you know, you got stream resident ones and might remain within a tributary network, not migrating more than a couple of miles over their whole lives, but you got stream resident ones that uh, will go 100 plus miles where they can between spawning and rearing habitat and to where they mainly live in maybe a lake like Flathead or something like that. Um, so a uh, diet uh, when they're smaller, mostly insects of various forms, but as they grow larger and especially the case with the migratory ones, but this happens with uh, the stream resident ones too, they become uh, very oriented towards eating other fish, including sometimes other bull trout. So they are increasingly piscivorous with increasing size. They are currently listed under the Endangered Species Act as threatened in the lower 48 states. They have been so in uh, range-wide in the lower 48 since 1999. All right. <clears throat> so the historical perspective, grayling both Michigan and Montana, historically very popular species. They were widely viewed as a noble fish. They were uh, one of the favorites of uh, American anglers. They would travel far and wide to catch. Partly goes back to European history because there is an, a Eurasian uh, strain of the grayling that the, you know is entrenched in European angling lore. So as people immigrate to the United States, they're like, hey, there's grayling in Michigan and then Montana and then, you know, nowhere else in the lower 48. Um, so uh, I just have a couple of historical documents here. I'm not going to read the whole things uh, to you, but they just give you a feel 
for how favorably people viewed Arctic Grayling, talking about them as the lady of the streams, uh, you know, raving about the appearance, talking about the refined habits. They live in clean water. Uh, they do not, you know, uh, they are not aggressive fish, you know, at least towards other fish. They are refined in their eating habits. There were huge uh, class pieces uh, to how people viewed fish where, you know, there was this hierarchy, uh, not too dissimilar from the human uh, class system, upper class, lower class, middle class, whatever. And, you know, things about human behavior, one's refined behavior, you know, nice appearance, yada, yada, yada. That was indicative on the fish side of a higher class fish. And the grayling was by any metric viewed as a high class fish. Bull hmm. trout, on the other hand, it's a very different story. Uh, there are scattered positive comments relating to bull trout in the historical record. And I say historical record, I'm talking, you know, 80 plus years ago. Some people liked, you know, the fight they could put up because they got so big. Uh, but uh, for the most part, bull trout are not viewed favorably. Uh, I think there was a Montana Fish and Game uh, commissioner who put it best when he referred to bull trout as the half game fish. Basically, because it was a member of this, uh, the salmon family, uh, it did hold some esteem because of that. But uh, bec ultimately, because of its uh, tendency to feed on other fish, especially at a time when, you know, state and federal agencies were stocking fish by the, you know, the hundred of thousand, uh, bull trout were viewed as the enemy of game fish that was undermining the, acti the hatchery activities. And the language that was used in Montana Fish and Game reports and newspapers and uh, other publications, uh, such as, you know, a menace to Montana angling, calling them freshwater sharks, calling for bounties to be put on the species, uh, put on the species, which never did happen, which I'm not going to get into it here, but I argue uh, in my book that they didn't really need to because people were so gung ho, ho about catching bull trout anyway and ripping, you know, taking them out of the water and saving other fish. So uh, there's just some su such fantastic stories. I got one here on the right, you know, talking about how this one bull trout, 11 pounds, supposedly consumed an entire litter of pigs and then uh, was about to eat uh, the pig's mother and to be saved by this Frank McAfee. And I'm like, how small is this pig when an 11 pound bull trout was supposedly going to eat it, but whatever. There's other stories of bull trout eating muskrats, all sorts of tales. And there is an element of truth that bull trout have been documented to eat uh, ducklings, frogs, snakes, things like that. But there is always uh, a layer of legendary status when it comes to predatory species, whether it's wolves, bull trout, so on and so forth. And this was, you know, what I got here on the screen is a couple of anglers, a couple of sportsmen's views of bull trout. Uh, but Montana Fish and Game, as I alluded to, did not view bull trout favorably for the longest time. Uh, this was in a couple of publications. Uh, I want to say it was about 19, it was 1929 and again in 1931. A couple of renditions of this piece, Cannibal of Montana Streams, appeared in uh one it was a fish and game report. The other was Montana Wildlife Magazine, which was basically its public mouthpiece, the agency's public mouthpiece. And um, it was very much uh, in helping to perpetuate and trench ideas of bull trout were this aquatic public enemy. And, you know, you got you can see the picture for yourself. But the interesting thing is when I shared this with uh, a now retired fisheries biologist uh, in the Bitterroot, uh, he was interested in emailing me, emailed me back. He's like, uh, that doesn't look like a bull trout. Uh, char species have darker backgrounds with lighter spots. This has lighter background with darker spots on it. The mouth looks a little bit small for a bull trout as well. So not sure exactly what it is, whether it's a brown trout or something like that. But it seems like a pretty big mistake for a fishing game official to make or something like that. So it's just a very interesting uh, historical document with the case of mistaken identi identity or the uh, straight up uh, deception involved there. But this is fascinating partly because I came across an article from a local, it was a Hamilton newspaper, Hamilton, Montana newspaper 
uh, I think it was about 19, it was the mid nineties. It was about the time that uh, talks about whether or not to list bull trout under the Endangered Species Act were uh, in full force. It, the the uh, state of Montana led by a governor was pushing back. They wanted a state, uh, state driven recovery initiative. A lot of folks wanted to keep, uh, you know, have Montana, Idaho, all the other states do it themselves. And so when they're talking about this, just, uh, what happens is that this, uh, there's a meeting, a trout unlimited meeting, and this geologist from the University of Montana uh, goes and gives a talk about geology, the implications for Montana's trout fisheries. And what happens is in the Q&A section, this guy, who's supposedly about 80, 90 years old, stands up and he's waving around this picture talking about the evils of bull trout and, you know, why they shouldn't be protected and all that sort of stuff. And it's like, buddy, it's not a bull trout, but whatever. So um, <laughs> it's, it's lasting evidence at that point of the bull trout's evil, if you will. So um, just trying to keep an eye on the time here. So as you might guess, then the species are treated very differently. Anglers would widely target bull trout. They would treat them like they did other trash fish. They ignored mm -hmm. uh, harvest limits, often just throwing them ashore. Grayling, on the other hand, are respected and pursued for sport. All right, so views do change over time uh, in the 90s. Uh, it's really in the 80s we start seeing some Montana fishing game really take measures to try to protect the species. And then by the nineties, it's going to move towards restoration. The seeds of it really lay in the forties. You see this article here, uh, this uh, a professor from the university of Montana gives a talk and he and others start talking about concerns they're having about quote unquote trash fish, such as suckers taking over various Montana waterways. And they say, well, it's because we took out, you know, we killed off so many bull trout that formerly kept those species in check. So people begin to reconsider their uh, views of bull trout based on that. Uh, and then this leads to scientific studies that are going to find that big surprise bull trout are on the decline in much of Montana. And one of the concerns that arises is there is a growing value on native fish species. For the longest time, it was about importing brook trout from the eastern U.S. It was about bringing, bringing in brown trout from Europe, rainbows from the Pacific coast. And uh, that shifts over time where as part of the environmental movement and other factors I'm not going to jump into deeply here, people begin valuing more deeply than ever cutthroat trout, bull trout, other species. And you see the article here from 1992 where bull trout is talked about as a native Montana that must be saved. Uh, it's viewed as an indicator species ba based on various studies that are being done where uh, bull trout disappearing often reflected changes in water quality that were not good, uh, the riparian uh, habitat, the vegetation, uh, in many areas compromised. In many areas, declining bull trout population was a sign that something was wrong with the stream. And so restoring bull trout would require improving things uh, overall. So uh, I already mentioned environmental movement. There was a growing concept of stewardship that the governor of Montana is really going to emphasize that native Montanans need to take care of their resources for future generations. All right. So we'll come back. So in Michigan, uh, you very quickly go over all these causes of decline. It's uh, uh, really this confluence of impacts that really just, by the 1930s, grayling are gone from Michigan. So the last documented grayling is caught, I believe it's in the UP, uh, the Otter River, 1935, if I recall. So the uh, one thing is overfishing, uh, accounts, uh, talk of anglers uh, wasting, if you will, uh, thousands of grayling catching them literally by the thousand, maybe keeping some, you know, salting some to take, but just, you know, for the pure sport of it, then discarding them. Uh, the railroad, uh, I think this was the Grand Rapids and Indiana Railroad, uh, marketed grayling in Michigan as one of the attractions to the region. And of course, you have the town of grayling, which is kind of depressing to think about, named after a fish that is no longer found there. Uh, but it used to be a hot spot 
for grayling fishing used to be a national and in some cases international destination for people who wanted to catch that particular relatively rare fish. So the uh, logging was a significant piece. You can see a photograph here at the, the left that was, you know, indicative of logging practice in the, in the, in the olden days there. Uh, logs you know, driven, you know, uh, push down stream, uh, stream banks into, into the rivers, you know, that causes all sorts of sedimentation issues and uh, just really degraded water quality in a lot of ways. And it destabilized banks. And that's important when you talk about rivers such as the Ausable, which are very sandy in nature. And just kicking up that sediment, destabilizing the banks was a problem for a fish that required uh, fairly high uh, uh, high quality habitat and uh, dams, as I mentioned before, a major issue. There'd be a series of hydroelectric power uh, dams built on the Ausable, for example, but even smaller logging dams that would, you know, block a tributary for a few miles, create a pool where there was once a running stream, causes all kinds of thermal issues, all kinds of stream flow problems, access issues for fish that uh, migrated between various areas. And of course, as I mentioned, non-native species are a factor here to brown trout, brook trout, uh, rainbows, all would be introduced to the ensemble that creates issues in terms of competition, predation, so on and so forth. So the, uh, and this was the case in other streams in Michigan, not just the ensemble. In Montana, it's kind of a similar story. Uh, over, uh, dams were an issue. Uh, a lot of those were to create irrigation reservoirs. Uh, you see a, a relatively minor one here at the right of your screen. Uh, there were some larger ones on the Madison River in particular to create large reservoirs. Uh, irrigation, a major issue. Stream watering, we've seen this come to fruition multiple times since the 1980s when the, the Big Hole, in particular, Big Hole River in Montana, uh, which is now home to the last remaining native fluvial grayling population. There is a small reintroduced, reintroduced population in the Ruby. I was out there a couple of years ago, talked to US Forest Service guy, and he said uh, the last stream survey was not uh, promising as far as that, that was looking. But uh, so the big hole is really the key in Montana to fluvial uh, stream dwelling grayling, but it's heavily, very heavily irrigated. It's a relative, it's a pretty dry area. There's years where, especially in drought, there have been uh, the big hole in some stretches has completely dried up. And last I checked, fish might need water. So that was a bit of a problem. So uh, grazing, riparian vegetation, a major issue in the big hole that has been to some degree uh, restored. You see these aerial photographs from 1942 and then just over 50 years later in 95, same stretch of the big hole. I mean, you can see the same roads and all that sort of stuff outlining it. And you got, you know, the darker areas indicating riparian vegetation on the left, almost completely gone on the right. And that is a major issue because studies have found that the removal of riparian vegetation from streamside areas, in many cases, will alter the fundamental nature of the stream itself. Basically, habitat and riparian complexity uh, has a bearing on the complexity of a stream. So if you remove riparian vegetation, and you make the habitat simpler, well, the stream habitat. You lose pools, you lose riffle sequences, things like that. And uh, fish, trout in particular, don't typically like to choose to live in plain old ditches. So that has an issue. Similarly, uh, non-native species. Uh, brook trout, major presence in the upper big hole, which is where uh, grayling now remain. Uh, brown and rainbows predominate downstream in the big hole where grayling used to be. Bull trout. All right, so bull trout, one of the things I, I didn't mention that I should have is bull trout are the, they're very picky in terms of water quality. They have very strict habitat requirements. Of all of the, uh, you know, salmonids, all of the salmon varieties, and trout, char, salmon, grayling, so on and so forth, found in the lower 48 states, they are the most temperature sensitive. They require the coldest uh, water of all the trout, char, so on and so forth, found in uh, 48 states. So uh, 
uh, clean water is required, connected waterways, especially for the migratory variety, very important. So dams a major problem, uh, whether it was major hydropower dams that were built on the Clark Fork and other major rivers on Montana, or even you know, I see one here at the left that uh, blocks passes, even smaller ones that, you know, for the sake of irrigation and uh, sawmill dams, uh, for an issue as well as far as fish passage goes. Basically cutting adult fish off uh, from the streams that they were born in and with high fidelity for bull trout would go back to uh, for spawning. There's multiple like, you know, studies and uh, reports of bull trout and other species gathering at the base of dams in Montana uh, seeking passage. And that's part of the reason why some have been uh, removed as part of bull trout restoration initiatives. Uh, Irrigation, major issue. I focus on the Bitterroot. Uh, many tributaries that are uh, key for uh, rearing uh, bull trout entirely dewatered, if not mostly, uh, it, on a seasonal basis as irrigation withdrawals really kick off. Back in the 80s, there were uh, portions of the Bitterroot that ran virtually dry because of irrigation withdrawals in the summer. Logging was historically a major issue. They used to hit uh, back in the 1890s at major uh, log drives on the Bitterroot, and that ties in with some grayling stuff I talked about in Michigan with sedimentation and all that. Mining, a major issue in Montana. Uh, you talk about the Upper Clark Fork, of which the Bitterroot feeds into the Clark Fork. Uh, Upper Clark Fork is the site now of the largest Superfund site in the United States. That's the Butte Anaconda complex, mining, tailings, it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute mess. And historically there are accounts from the 1890s, some of the first extensive fish surveys that were done by the United States government. And they're like, there's nothing that can live in this water as far down as Missoula, which you're talking dozens and dozens and dozens of miles from Butte. It is just completely fouled water. And still today, uh, Montana is still trying to recover some of the populations in the upper Clark Fork system. So mining, a major problem uh, in parts of Montana. Non-natives, again, an issue. Here, uh, you might think, oh, you know, a big uh, predatory fish wouldn't necessarily have issues with competitors, but it turns out that hybridization in particular with brook trout is a problem in streams. Uh, Studies have found that where brook trout move into bull trout streams, hybridization often follows. And within a decade, it's been documented that bull trout will vanish from study reaches and brook trout and hybrids will become more common. And you have a photograph here from the National Park Service at the bottom that is a bull brook hybrid. And they are often typically sterile. Uh, so there are a number of issues related uh, to that as well. And in comparison with other, uh, the hatchery fish that were introduced, bull trout are long lived. They reproduce relatively late in life. They are sl relatively slow growing in the stream. So there were competition issues as well with the non-native fish. Uh, harvest is an issue. I mentioned before bull trout not viewed very nicely uh, by Montanans uh, until relatively recently. There are countless stories of uh, being killed with uh, pitchforks, dynamite, uh, nets being snagged, uh, and uh, poaching is in some parts of Montana still an issue when it comes to bull trout. All right, really quickly, both species, as you might guess, a special bull trout, I mentioned that temperature sensitivity, uh, climate change has been documented for both to be a challenge, grayling. Uh, you read through the literature and you can't help but come across uh, with, you know, come away with the impression that Grayling range has probably been uh, contracting since the last ice age. They are glacial relics left over from the last ice age in Michigan and Montana. You know, that's, that's how you explain that, that those pockets, that patchy distribution. And it is uh, hypothesized with, you know, some evidence to indicate that it, that was the case. Their range has contracted you know, uh, progressively since the last ice age, since temperatures warmed up and all that sort of stuff. But in the big hole, we've seen you know, uh, a series of droughts that really began in the 1970s, but then intensified in the 80s and 90s that have been a problem for grayling uh, there. The uh, bull trout, uh, you have a couple of very colorful maps here at the right. Uh, the 
U.S. Forest Service, their Climate Shield uh, study, which looks at cold water habitats for bull trout. Uh, they use a 1980 baseline and they did projections for 2040s. And then I think it was again, maybe 2080s. But basically, the, the long and short of it is with ongoing climate change at the, at the paces that we've seen over the last 40 years or so, bull trout range is expected to contract significantly over time. And to add that interspecies piece to it, the map at the right includes uh, if brook trout are also present, that's expected to exacerbate the impact on bull trout as brooks, uh, brookies move into uh, bull trout habitat and help to force them further upstream. And then you get the hybridization piece to bring back into it as well. The outlook is not great. Uh, all right, early conservation uh, in Michigan, it was uh, angling restrictions were too little too late. There was not a complete ban on grayling uh, harvest until they were pretty much gone. Before that, they had some uh, size minimums, things like that, but there wasn't much in the way of angling restrictions for, before grayling were gone. Uh, fish culture, as you might guess, was uh, the main way that they try to preserve Michigan grayling. They imported thousands upon thousands of eggs, as you can see here, from Montana. This is just a sample of 1933 to 1960. They did uh, uh, a bunch more before that time, and it had done some since, uh, and none of it worked. Uh, no grayling uh, that anybody can tell survived from any of these, became established in Michigan waterways, and I could talk a little bit more about that later, the why there. But basically using uh, eggs from Montana to try to prop up the declining Michigan grayling population did not work out. A uh, similar approach in Montana. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. So there was a similar approach. They did successfully transplant grayling to a number of lakes in Montana, but by uh, studies have shown uh, genetic and otherwise, it does not appear that the stocks used for grayling propagation and hatchery and hatcheries became established anywhere in Montana streams. So very similar story to what happened in Michigan, just complete failure to establish grayling in streams. Uh, there has been recently, I think it was in the, net, either in the late 80s, or early 90s, that the state of Montana enacted a no harvest regulation for uh, grayling in streams and habitat protection is also relatively recent, I'm talking like 1980s, 1990s, and more up to today. So historically, both Michigan and Montana Hatchery work, the main method of attempting to, uh, you know, preserve and increase grayling populations. And you can see here a couple of pieces of uh, tables that I compiled from my recent uh, article that appeared in Montana uh, Magazine of Western History. It, the scale was pretty considerable in Montana by both federal and state agencies. And just to think about how little uh, that really achieved, especially when you, you know, take lakes out of the pictures, do much. Bull trout conservation. As you might guess, there was uh, really nothing until relatively recently. Interestingly, as in early as 1932, there were some limited attempts to put uh, bull trout in the hatchery, but not much came of that. They, uh, they reported, you go through the hatchery logs, there were tremendous losses. Almost all the fish were lost for one reason or another. They started hatching early and it just did not end well. And so there really was not much of a place uh, for old trout to be propagated in hatcheries and still today is not a piece for genetic concerns of bull trout conservation, excuse me, in Montana. So the minimal propagation efforts for bull trout that really stepped up in the 40s and in the 50s did not achieve anything. Uh, there were... Uh, some studies that began to be conducted in the 1950s uh, in the Flathead and other places in Montana. Uh, not long after that, because the fish were uh, found to be decreasing, the state of Montana did start enacting some spawning stream closures for fishing, not allowing fishing where bull trout spawned uh, to help uh, protect the species. Uh, harvest limits would be progressively enacted uh, to the point where, in large part because of the Endangered Species Act, Bull trout can only be harvested 
it's in a couple of locations. It's changed over the years between like one and three locations in Montana where the populations are extremely healthy, but otherwise targeting harvesting bull trout is not uh, permitted now. And it was a progressive move up towards that. All right, recent stuff. Uh, recent grayling conservation in Montana has been more holistic, if you will, compared to the past. You know, let's produce a ton of them in a hatchery and dump them in a stream approach. Uh, habitat protection has assumed a huge role in grayling uh, protection, uh, I should say restoration. Uh, part, of the, part of the reason why the uh, fish has not been listed under the Endangered Species Act is according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the operation of a candidate conservation agreement with assurance as a CCAA, which basically you work with landowners, a variety of agencies to do these voluntary conservation initiatives. And the, the ultimate goal is to, you know, if not, you know, just help the species, prevent it from becoming uh, listed uh, under the Endangered Species Act. So there's been a number of voluntary uh, stream habitat improvements and other projects. Uh, you know, keeping livestock away from the streams, uh, restoring flow in a lot of tributaries that are important for spawning and for juvenile fish. Uh, Inflame flows have been a major uh, point of uh, initiative in uh, Montana, uh, trying to, I had that document earlier, drought and inflame flows, you know, installing water tanks, the livestock water rather than having, you know, diverting considerable volumes of water from the big hole in a very dry area. Uh, so insulin flows have been a huge point of emphasis and there are uh, voluntary uh, efforts to when stream flow reaches a certain level that irrigators can agree to either reduce or cut out their withdrawals. And that's another thing that's been cited in uh, the, the Fish and Wildlife Services decision to not list ground. Uh, a big part of it is, and it's going to lead us to the, the, the photograph, finally, what's it been? It's been like, you know, uh, 30, 40 some minutes. I'll explain the significant of, significance of the photograph behind me is uh, state of Montana maintaining multiple captive brood stocks. This uh, photograph behind me, I took a couple of years ago. This is in the axolotl chain of lakes near Ennis in Montana. This is where one of the state's brood stocks of grayling is maintained. The fish are derived, uh, taken from the big hole population. They're kept in a lake. Uh, new genes, uh, gametes, are infused into the population every few years to maintain its genetic integrity and keep the fish, you know, uh, keep the fluvial genes in them, the stream dwelling genes in them, even though they live in a lake. Uh, so this has been a key to the use of what you see in the stream here. At the left, these are called remote site incubators, RSIs. It's basically a fancy name for a five gallon, gallon bucket with an intake tube uh, and then a tube that goes out of it. And you put some gravel in it, you put the fish uh, eggs in it. And this allows the grayling eggs to incubate in the stream. And because that's because uh, fishery biologists have arrived at the conclusion like salmon and other species, uh, grayling imprint into their natal waters. And what that means is they will then uh, later in life return to those same streams uh, to spawn themselves. And that's believed to have been the critical flaw in past uh, grayling uh, stocking efforts in streams, why those did not work out because they were often planted uh, at the fry or larger stage. Uh, sometimes eggs were used, but they were just kind of put in the stream and not really protected or anything like that. So. Uh, nothing really came of them. And the, the other interesting layer that you see here is that uh, RSI is put just downstream of a uh, irrigation uh, structure. And that creates a little bit of a pool that is friendly uh, for the, the fry, you know, creates some slower water, a bit of a pool for them as they emerge from RSI. So Michigan. No, oh, uh, the photograph at the, the, the right here is just a photograph of the uh, upper big hole and just uh, really highlights, I think, some of the work that's been done to restore uh, stream bank uh, vegetation, which is very important as cover for fish, but also uh, maintaining the integrity of 
the in-stream habitat as well. Grayling. Uh, in Michigan, uh, they're, they're taking a lot of cues from Montana. They are launching a new grayling restoration initiative, very much looking to Montana. The last real experiment with grayling in Montana was in the late, I'm sorry, Michigan was the late 80s, early 90s. Again, Montana grayling eggs. They tried a number of different streams. They also tried some juveniles and whatnot, and, and it did not bear fruit again. But now they have the RSIs, and that's really what they're banking on in Michigan. They're looking at, uh, the other piece is suitable habitat. So they're looking at habitat selection as far as streams that have enough connectiv connectivity that aren't too, you know, that aren't much in the way of uh, degraded by a number of land use practices. And there's not a heavy presence of non-native fish, fish species. So in a lot of areas that really limits the uh, real, real possibilities. I know one of the areas that they're really, they really honed in on was the upper Manistee is probably, uh, again, I think the last news I saw was a couple months ago and it had to do with how well the hatchery fish are doing that they brought in from Alaska. But uh, at any rate, they're looking at, you know, relatively what we might call quote unquote pristine habitat, but also using these RSIs to help the fish implant into the streams. And, uh, okay. and as I mentioned, the last thing I saw was uh, a news article about how well uh, the brood stock that they got from Alaska is doing in a, a Michigan hatchery as they're getting ready to do this. It should be in the next couple of years that they're uh, looking to get some eggs in the water. All right, recent bull trout conservation. In 1980s, it was made a species of concern in Montana, basically statewide added to a list of fish that they're gonna keep an eye on in the state. Harvest limit was really reduced in the state. And uh, 1992, uh, three conservation organizations in Montana petitioned the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for a listing. And this set off a six year scuffle between the state, federal government, uh, conservation agencies, multiple court cases before uh, they were listed in the Klamath and Oregon and Columbia uh, River drainage uh, as threatened. And then the next year, 1999, more populations in the contiguous 48 were added, basically a range-wide listing followed the next year. So uh, while the battle was playing out in the courts and all that, uh, the state of Montana and Idaho also and uh, launched their own uh, state-level recovery initiative. They created a scientific team. They created round tables. They did all these sorts of things to try to do kind of what the grayling, what's going on with grayling in the big hole, and that is voluntary collaborative efforts among landowners, uh, state and federal agencies uh, to forestall a federal listing. And that came to naught because in 1998, uh, because of growing pressure from conservation groups and also uh, growing evidence of bull trout were in severe trouble for a number of reasons throughout the Pacific Northwest. They were listed as threatened. And the reports for bull trout indicate that listing and the initiatives that have followed, there wasn't a final recovery plan until a few years ago. Uh, but a lot of the recovery initiatives undertaken from local watershed groups on up to the federal government. It varies from area to area, but the net result is basically been slowing the decline of bull trout because so many of the problems are widespread and so deep rooted from habitat stuff to non-native fish species, good luck getting them all out, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of problems that face bull trout conservation and the progress has been limited. So that very happy history. All these, you know, these good vibes from recent conservation initiatives where there's some progress being made, but these species are still very much in limbo. What conclusions do we draw? Yes, it is difficult to be optimistic about the grayling's future in the big hole. They're doing tremendous in lakes. 
in about three dozen ish lakes in Montana. But the problem is you lose the fluvial variety. You lose that, you know, the, that genetic piece where there are fundamental differences researchers are found between, you know, lake dwelling and stream dwelling, brailing, not doing so well in the big one. Mm. Uh, I am hopeful about the Michigan reintroduction effort. I think you almost have to expect failure and be happy if it succeeds. I mean, you look at the Ruby, you look at other places where it attempted in Montana, Ruby's the only real success story. There were a handful of other places where it did not work out in Montana. So uh, I'm hopeful, but I can't, it's not one you can bank on working out. And then Bull trout. It is very difficult to be optimistic about that, especially in the face of ongoing climate change in particular. So, but I, I did have this little, you know, I had a nice conversation uh, a couple summers ago uh, with uh, in Missoula with David Schmetterling, who is a uh, research biologist uh, with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. So I sat down and Dave talked to him for maybe it was like an hour or something like that. And it, it's a lot of doom and gloom conversation because it's, it's a massive project. The history here that we've gone over is just so deep and to try to reverse that is such a massive undertaking. And, you know, I'm sitting there and behind me on the wall is a huge map of Western Montana. And as I'm talking to David, he's looking at it, the different areas that we're talking about. And he's like, you know, I, it, it, it's saddening. It's frustrating, but he's like, you know what? I have hope because bull trout are still, despite everything that's happened to the populations, how they've been fragmented, how they've been isolated, how they've, you know, really eroded in numbers and range and all that. They're still in a lot of these places, maybe not in the numbers we'd like or in the scale we'd like in terms of range and all that, but they're there. And he said, they're going to be there for a while, especially since we've started doing some things. So I, I kind of came, came out of that meeting a little more hopeful than I had been because as is the case with so much history, uh, a lot of it's really depressing and you come up with, with a pessimistic view of human nature. But I sat down with David and I'm like, you know what? There, there is hope here. So what can we do? Well, I think that uh, Chris Clancy, who's the fisheries biologist that I mentioned who recently recently retired in the Bitterroot after serving, it was about 20 years because I think they brought him on in 1989. And, you know, this quote here, you know, the two biggest challenges for fisheries in general in the Bitterroot, and this can apply to other parts of Montana. Uh, one, it's very local, you know, residential commercial development in riparian areas along streams and, you know, places like the Bitterroot and other parts of Montana uh, growing very fast. So that is a major concern is this sort of development. But then two is, is bigger than that. That is climate change. And you talk to any fishery, fisheries biologist, you look at the climate shield thing, which if you know, this is something that interests you, get around and mess around on the Climate Shield site from the U.S. Forest Service. There's so much data and so much fascinating information. Is it exactly uplifting? No, uh, because the outlook isn't great, but that's something to keep in mind as far as we do this. So the historical perspective, I argue, as I wrap this up here, is just really critical piece, I think, and this is an argument I make in my forthcoming environmental history article about railing in Michigan and Montana is having that historical perspective. And a lot of conservation documents, a lot of you know the conversations do have some involvement with the history of the decline, maybe sometimes the conservation efforts. I find that's usually lacking. And I think you know just learning for what to do, you know, regarding what to do now and what to do going forward really does require a lot of backward looking to one, how did we get here? And two, uh, what did we try to b before that either worked or did not work out well? And I think, you know, just presenting these two case studies of uh, bull trout and Arctic grayling, I think it really tells us a lot about certainly where we've come from and maybe gives us at least some ideas of, you know, certainly ongoing challenges that need to be overcome, things that need to and need to be done. So uh, that wraps it up on, you know, me just talking at everybody. So I certainly would welcome any questions, whatever. I have not been able to see the chat, so I don't know if that's blowing up or whatever. And I don't know if somebody normally...
before we open up uh, questions for the group on the board, but on behalf of the SAVE board, I would like to thank Dr. Hodge for this excellent presentation and remind everyone that uh, this is our, our final presentation for this season. And we will have lectures beginning again in the fall, uh, probably on a Zoom fashion because of COVID. So uh, let's uh, open up any questions that anyone would like to ask. Doing this right as it uh, started to get dark, I think it helped ease folks into a slumber. <laughs> you, Dr. This Hodge, is John. I was quite taken with the uh, grilling uh, attempts at restoration up in uh, Michigan. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, what, what was the question? I was take. I was quite taken with the grilling uh, attempts at restoration up in uh, Michigan. Yeah, uh, yeah. It started uh, a few years ago. There's the uh, website. It's the Michigan Arctic Grayling Initiative. I think is the full name. If you want to dig into it, they got some interesting uh, documents on there, and it's. Uh, I'm very curious to see uh, how it goes. It's popped up in the, in the news uh, here and there, and it's. Uh, I, it's certainly a noble endeavor, and I hate to be pessimistic about it, but looking at the past, it's. I wish them the best. <laughs> as, is, as in the case of some uh, wildfowl, uh, there are controls on what can be taken. Uh, it, when people are trout fishing, is it, is it all catch and release? And how do they control uh, people harvesting these illegally, if that is the case? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, it's it, it, it really with bull trout, it starts with identification because it looks so similar to brook trout. So one of the education campaign, one of the campaigns they did was an education campaign to be able to, you know, for anglers to distinguish between brook trout and bull trout, especially since they're often set, found in the same streams. And uh, so that was part of it. Part, the other part was an education piece to overturn those longstanding, excuse me, uh, misconceptions about bull trout. But and to make people care about them because, you know, I think part of what you're getting at is fish and wildlife, uh, you know, the wardens, they can't just be everywhere all the time to make sure anglers are behaving themselves. So there's a lot of, you know, you get the license and all that. There's a lot of honor system involved to make, you know, that, okay, you're going to abide by the regulations because I've had my license check maybe once in Montana. And, you know, obviously there's the creel checks. If, you know, a warden does come by, if you do have a creel or something like that, but uh, the things that they, how they try to mid minimize bull trout targeting and harvest is there are certain methods of fishing because bull trout tend to be aggressive and even the stream resident ones tend to attack certain types of lures uh, more readily than say other trout. And uh, so, I mean, it, police the targeting, that's very difficult. Policing the harvest is much e easier, even if people can, you know, plead ignorance if they do get caught. Oh, I thought it was brook trout, whatever. And people still sometimes call them brook trout uh, in certain areas. So uh, it's a lot of it is putting the rules in place and hoping that people abide by it. And same thing with the grayling on the uh, big hole. You know, even though it's just one river, it's a lot of real estate for you know one or two wardens to try to police. And so it's like, hey. If we say this is catch and release only, we're going to trust that most of you are honorable folks and are going to listen to that. Mm -hmm. Adam, you mentioned a number of times about the Endangered Species Act, and you said they, you were hoping, or some they were hoping that it wouldn't make that list. Uh, what is what are the pros and cons of that list? I mean, I just know basically about about it, but why would you not want them to? put it on the list? Well, uh, <clears throat> with bull trout until it happened, and then now with grayling, uh, landowners uh, are fearful that 
it'll mean more federal regulations and to some degree it would and it would mean restriction on their activities it would mean curbing further their irrigation withdrawals i i mean these people make a living in a very arid very difficult land you know it's 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 a ranching country uh the big hole for example so uh they are understandably trying to protect uh their livelihoods and the the cons would be they think at least pretty significant in that regard from state level. And this is the case uh, with the bull trout and to some degree with the grayling, but it really came out of the bull trout. Uh, Montanans and the state and the governor did not want to surrender their responsibility, their stewardship, their power uh, to manage their own resources. And so, you know, they don't want to let another resource and that was the term that came up and time and time again to slip away from them and go fall into federal hands uh are the statements about the loss of rights about the loss of power and you know a livelihood often overstated sure i'm sure in many cases i don't think the loss of anything in a lot of cases would be as much as people expect but you know again a lot of these people are scraping uh, buy with their livings in a lot of cases and very, you know, you know, continue very uh, dependent on uh, the water that grayling and bull trout would need. So, I mean, certainly the pros would be, you know, it's, it's more hands on deck, uh, but an automatic con comes with that too. And we saw this with bull trout, they get listed in 98. I'm pretty sure it's 2016 that there's that the, the final recovery act, it, uh, f I'm sorry, final recovery plan is approved. So it took almost two decades mm. of a variety of legal things and review processes and multiple five-year reviews to get at this final. So it adds more, you know, red tape, so to speak, to the process. So it could bring in more resources, it could bring in more manpower, but it also brings in more, you know, government machinery, if you will, yeah. and politics, quite frankly. So um, there, I, I think that, uh, I don't know, I sort of uh, talked in circles there, but there, there are a number of pros and cons. And I, I do think there is something to what folks are arguing in the big hole where you look at the, the, the CCAA, you look at the drought management plans, a lot of folks have bought into that. Uh, part of it is out of fear of, federal intervention, but part of it is you read what these, these folks are saying and writing, and there has been to some degree an understanding of their stewardship role. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I go back and forth on whether or not Arctic grayling should be listed. And uh, one of the things that, you know, an argument in favor of it staying in, in Montana is that it is a Montana issue. Bull trout were multiple states and on up into Canada, which added a whole nother layer of issues with it when, you know, proposed mine, mine, uh, mining operations were proposed and way up in the uh, upper North Fork Flathead tributary in Canada, they would have implications for bull trout downstream. The U.S. and Canada had this powwow over, uh, over that. So all that's to go back to, uh, I would say with grayling, it is probably less of an absolute necessity to get the endangered species listing mm -hmm. uh, bull trout. I do think it was more critical to have a coordinated comprehensive approach across multiple states. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's great. And if anybody has any other questions uh, that uh, doesn't wanna go uh, on the microphone, you can always text them in to the chat box. Mm -hmm. Probably not a whole lot of fishermen here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably. It's probably part of it, but uh, yeah. But it's interesting with the climate change and you are seeing, you know, this in, in just two little organisms, you know, but um, you know, there's many other things that are being affected too. I was reading today about the turtles, you know, they're being affected by climate change and the polar bears are being, you know, affected by climate change. And, you know, what, what can you do about it? Not too much. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that it's a, it's an all hands on deck sort of deal. And 
obviously beyond just the U.S. too, which has certainly been a long-standing challenge as well. And uh, yeah, it's just the breadth of the climate change uh, climate change challenge is massive. And uh, we'll try in particular just one example of how big of a deal it is. And it's it, and I just think it's fascinating to put it in you know juxtapose it with the non-native species issue. Because to go back to the brook trout piece, eastern brook trout, as the name implies, uh, native to the eastern U.S. Now, again, guessing that most folks in here are not uh, fly fishermen, uh, eastern brook trout are imperiled in their own way, in their own, in the native range in eastern North America. And I mean, they're in very serious trouble for a number of reasons that include climate change, but also industry logging, so on and so forth. Uh, Brook trout restoration is a uh, significant initiative in parts of the eastern U.S. And now, you know, because of the historic plantings, they have a considerable presence in the North American uh, West. Uh, so these areas where they are a problem species, so to speak, such as with brook tr uh, bull trout, such as with grayling in the upper big hole, uh, that, that is their refuge now because they're in trouble elsewhere. Uh, so there, there's that piece to consider too. And the, one of the fascinating things with brook trout, bull trout interactions is that I skim the surface, especially on the science side of a lot of this is, you know, I, the interspe interspecific interactions are fascinating because uh, you look at a lot of streams in Montana, and this has been documented, is how much of the bull trout contraction is due to replacement, which means one species moves in and the other declines or moves out. And how much is it I'm sorry, it's replacement is uh, one, a vacuum opens because one leaves and the other one moves in, sorry, and displacement where one moves in and forces the other out. Mm -hmm. And there's evidence of brook trout causing displacement through hybridization and whatever. And this is partly documented because in many streams, there is segregation at the species level where the lower couple miles of a tributary are dominated by bro uh, brook trout and there's very few bulls you go, and then you almost cross this imaginary line, and there's it's it's dominated by bull trout, and it might almost be bull trout, but studies have found that over a year, sometimes five to ten, there is a progress uh, progression upstream of the brook trout and bull trout retreating upstream, and so uh, that also pushes bull trout further into uh, you know cooler water refuges. So uh, that's an example of displacement there. Uh, to a large degree, and brook trout do better in impacted environments, uh, you know, sedimentation, water temperature, so on and so forth, than do bull trout. But then this is especially evident that, that the climate change piece is especially evident when you look at other streams where uh, brown trout have advanced up upstream and bull trout have retreated. And this is, there's an example of a, a, a creek called a Sleeping Child Creek in the Bitterroot where over the last 20 or so years, uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks has maintained a, uh, a uh, standard monitoring site where they do their stream surveys. And it used to be significant population of uh, bull, bull trout and almost no, if none, uh, brown trout. Now, brown trout, uh, they favor you know, warmer stream temperatures. Uh, bull trout need the cooler water, all that. Well, in now you go to that same spot it's almost it, it's it's heavily browns brown trout and there's almost no if none bull trout and that is an example of uh replacement uh the studies have found where bull trout have sort of retreated and then following up behind them are uh the browns as the water's uh warm so rambling there but it, it's 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 related isn't that the same thing though with the uh... With the Asian carp, you know, there are people, I mean, in Lake Erie were afraid that if Asian carp come in, they could take over. And um, and so, you know, they're trying to to block it near Chicago. And, um, you know, I think probably a lot of species are doing the same thing. You know, they move to a different place, take over the area, and it's totally different, just like you said. The other ones are displaced. Yeah, that's an that's an apt uh, point there. Where invasive species are 
a major challenge because in many areas it's it's absolute headache if not nearly impossible to get them out uh you have some success stories i think it was uh i know there's been a successful campaign to some degree against sea lamprey and the great lakes and whatnot but when you get all these different species and all these different waters it be pretty much in many areas unless you want to go to the point of fish toxicants which again even those aren't fully you know uh you know uh guaranteed to do their job it's it, it's a deep-rooted issue and then you pair that with climate change but yeah i mean invasive species is kind of the and whether it's the you know the unwanted accidental ones or the ones that you once wanted a hundred years ago i'm looking at you brown trout brook trout rainbows that become nuisance species when we decide oh hey they're bad for the native guys that we now value yeah there's so many layers to it same situation with plants too you get invaded by none by invasive you know non-indigenous species and then they take over and then your species that are normally there are not there anymore so it's it's happening on a lot of levels absolutely loss of native grasslands all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. major issue you know adam with my observation of nature it's always in a period of transition uh it may take a while or time but it does happen I remember the uh, Stark Brothers, uh, famous nursery uh, uh, generators, found a apple that was unique in, uh, in Missouri. And uh, they called it a delicious apple. But in the 1840s, that was a marked change in the uh, progress of the apple that, uh, what, 170, 180 years later, uh, look at the different species of apples that derived from that, that delicious. Mm -hmm. uh, brand. And, and again, if, uh, if transition is a nature of nature, uh, I think that invasive species were bound to happen. And uh, the ability of the remaining species to try to adapt, I'm thinking in terms of early human ancestors, the Homo sapiens had blended with uh, Neanderthals, which blended with Homo erectus, which produces uh, humanity that we have today, but uh, mm -hmm. it was it was nothing more than crossbreeding. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, and it's it, it is crazy to think about our modern world and what is you know quote unquote native and what is not, and that's certainly something I try to get across. And even just my U.S. survey classes, but certainly getting into my environmental history class and now my current uh, American animal history class that I'm teaching is just how much of the world around us we look, whether it is, you know, it, it plants, whether it is animals, uh, wouldn't have been here if it wasn't for human beings. Mm -hmm. For better or for worse. <laughs> you don't really. What's that? I just, did you see the chat from Bev Bingle? She wishes her charter captain brother in Michigan would pay attention to presentations like this. <laughs> <laughs> I am an angler as well. Thanks for all the information on the grayling. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, long way off from having a potentially fishable population up there of uh, grayling, but hey, we could cross our fingers, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, this was a, a very great lecture, um, Adam, and I'm glad I asked you about that, I don't know, what, two years ago or whatever, to be able to give this, because I saw that you had, you know, um, uh, in, interest in the environment through the, the fishing that you do. So that's really important. And I'd like to encourage you to keep on and know you will, you know, and, and see where it goes. But we're very grateful that you give up this night to be able to do that for us. You're welcome. And uh, thank you for inviting me. And, and no problem to keep on. I mean, there's always more field work to do. So I'm happy to continue my, my, my very important work great mm -hmm. well thank you very much thank you for all everybody who was here listening thank you for the people in the chat and um we wish you a, a good evening <laughs> <laughs>